So our next speaker is um, Ms. Ujala Sadhur, and I've got a long um, biography, but she said not nothing of that. So I will just introduce her as the Executive Director, University of Cape Town Libraries, and we look forward to your talk. Okay, good afternoon everybody. I must at the very outset thank Ellen and her team for going ahead with the uh, going ahead with the symposium. It's given us the opportunity to get together and to to meet and to chat and to rekindle some of our, our relationships as well after about 18 months. But I must admit that when it was time for me to get here, I have not felt as nervous as I do now. You know, and I said, I wish I did this online because suddenly that became the mode of us working and being most comfortable in our own spaces, etc. But now being able to speak to you directly, suddenly there's this huge sense of responsibility. You know, I've got to make eye contact with you and I, I'm so unused to that at this stage in, in our practice and professional lives. But be that as it may, I've chosen to, to consider the topic of when crises converge. Um, leading and managing library, academic libraries during a time of crisis. And I'm, if any one of you are here expecting to hear me speak about the fire, I'm not going to speak about the fire. I don't have a single photograph of the fire. And so I'm looking at crises and how we have over the years displayed our resilience. And listening to Lisa, listening to Liz Longer this morning, there's a convergence of thought. And I think Henrietta, my, 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 my presentation is actually over. I don't need to continue. <laughs> but nevertheless, colleagues, I'm going to go through this presentation and I do invite you to, to engage with it hereafter. And so when we talk about convergence, you know, typically we want to understand what is the concept. And, and I, I did quite a bit of research. And basically it is when two or more things come together to form a new whole or a new entity or a new way of thinking and doing. And a typical example of convergence is cultural convergence where we talk about the global village. The whole world is a global village, but it also comes with its own questions. Is it acculturation or assimilation or whatever it is that we want to interpret it as? But what at the heart of it is a commonality that emerges. We begin to see common values, common practices, common acceptances. And we were just talking, you know, at the table at lunch today that it's given us this, this lockdown has given us the opportunity to explore at one level new things. But it has also given us the opportunity to retreat into that which we are comfortable with. So convergence really is about bringing things together, bringing crises together, bringing like-minded people together, etc. So, and so when we talk about the types of convergence, the major convergence we actually experienced was that of technological convergence. And we saw here where we found common platforms being created out of different types of technologies. And the most um, accessible one at the moment is our smartphone. That is a typical example of technological convergence. Another very good example is Netflix, which started out as a DVD rental company. But now, together with the web and new technologies, et cetera, it is one of the fastest growing entities, and it has kept us entertained during lockdown. I, I mentioned cultural convergence and service convergence as well, how we've been adapting ourselves over the years, not just over the last 18 months. If you look at yourself as an academic librarian or as the director of an academic library, we're always one step ahead. 
and our services are constantly adapting and re redefining themselves, we re-envisioning, etc. And so there are very various other types of convergences. We're coming into election time now, and you'll see the political convergence. People with like-minded thoughts or disgruntlement with government will bandy together, and so they will get a whole new way of voting the choices we make as well. And, and so we are actually always living in a time of convergence. And so it made me think then that the lockdown is not the only opportunity, and Lisa has mentioned it, that it wasn't the only time for us to emerge into our own. We've been doing that ever since we are, have been practicing, and most notably when we started looking at what is the 21st century academic library. And again, this is a quote, that it, it, it's, it's the one that will be, that, sorry, the successful library of the future will be the one that has found new ways of meeting its stakeholders' needs. And that is what has always driven us across the decades, not just the years, but the decades. And we will see that as we go forward. And in doing so, we have all striven for success. We've been striving for success. Somebody mentioned earlier on about competition as organizations, etc., and that serves as impetus as well. How do we review? How do we align, realign, review in a cyclical fashion so that we maintain continued relevance, we maintain our sustainability, but most importantly, how we demonstrate our value within the milieu that we function in. And so we've worked concertedly at deconstructing the library, not only under times of crisis. We've been deconstructing the library and library practice, and I've listed why and where we have been doing that, and most notably, in terms of library as space and place, because we say we want to create that ambient learning experience for our different categories of stakeholders, etc. We've even now, you know, swimming in the same ponds around knowledge creation as co-creators, etc. Curation and sharing. We're looking at unique collections and digital resources. And again, the question rises. What about unique collections? Why? What is the relevance of it? Where are we pitching ourselves in that particular milieu as well? And then also new trends that actually become the impetus for challenging practice. However, core practice will always be there. And so when we look at how we have been practiced, I've, I've looked particularly at the notion of innovation, where we always embrace sustained innovation. How do we do things better for our user groups? How do we do things better for our existing stakeholders? And we're constantly measuring ourselves. The user experience at one stage, that was the flavor of the month. Everybody's look, doing surveys around user experience. That what is that dynamic experience of either the undergraduate or the researcher or the postgraduate? How do we embrace research support? What are we doing? Constantly environmental scanning to see how can we go that further step. Library as desired place. Fred Kent, an, uh, a renowned architect, um, library architect, said, and he had juxtaposed the Maslow hierarchy of needs to this particular model of library as a desired place. We look at access and linkages, sociability of our spaces. Gosh, the, I don't know when we're going to be back in those environments. Uses and activities of our spaces. How do we encourage that social and academic engagement? And there are people who come, who came to the library and who will come to the library as well, not necessarily for an academic experience, but because it is comfortable. 
It's safe, it's conducive, and the image that the library represents within the academic project. And then ob obviously, in times of crises, you recognize the library as a political space. Not many of us realize this, but it is a highly political space, and it is time that we actually embrace it as such. With the development agenda, the sustainable development goals, etc., increasingly, the academy is pursuing research in those areas, and it is forcing us to look at the notion of social justice. However, social justice is not a new concept. Remember, it is embraced and embedded within our constitution, but how have we, as librarians, as library directors, embedded that in our practice, the notion of social justice and the development agenda? And so, of course, during this time, as well, not the COVID times, but during this time of development as academic libraries, we have embraced disrupted innovation as well. Clayton Christensen, who's, uh, who's an economist and who fielded this particular theory, spoke about disrupti disruptive innovation as that which creates a new foothold in markets or areas where none existed. And for many academic libraries, this gave us the opportunity to explore new things. And we saw that when we became the champion, we became the leaders of, of open access, the research data management, enhancing research visibility on campuses. And we spoke about being partners to the academy as well, embracing new roles such as library as publisher, and I know at UCT with our open monographs and textbooks and Stellenbosch also, you have your open publishing um, program as well. But we've also infused ourselves in um, research, teaching and learning. I, I don't like to say we inserted ourselves. We've permeated, we've infused ourselves to such an extent that many of us consider us as invisible but we can also say we're very visible in our invisibility on campus or at a university. We're looking particularly now at scholarly and digital capabilities so that we have a single language that prevails on campus, both academics and students, so that we understand each other when we engage within the academy. Student success is becoming very much a priority. There's a program at, at UCT at the moment called the Sia Pumalela program, where we're looking at what are those aspects that are going to ensure student success under lockdown. But it is something that we have been talking about, how do we contribute to student success? But now we are going to have those opportunities of being able to say, how does the library contribute, especially under lockdown, to the continuance of the academic program and the success of the academic program for those institutions that completed it? We're seeing our role in curriculum transformation as well through the use of the tools, access, and, and making available all of those resources that were not possible during this particular time. In terms of the library as a partner, I, I, I strongly, I have strong aversions when we talk about ourselves as support services. We're not support services. We lead, we facilitate, we create the environments, and yet we put ourselves down when we say, we're just academic support. No, we're not. We are a partner at the institution. And so I did not look at context at the very beginning, because that is what we've already been doing. The slides that I've shared with you, that is the, the point at which we went into lockdown. It isn't something new. We've been doing this now for many, many years. 
but our context within which we function is like shifting sand. It's changing all the time. And even you heard it this morning when, when DVC Langa spoke about what is happening in the teaching and learning environment as well. And so we're very familiar with the changing higher education landscape, and I'm not going to touch on that. But the crucial thing within that particular context is transformation. We cannot ignore transformation. Transformation is staring us in the face and we can no longer brush it aside as a tick box exercise. It, we are being challenged to actually demonstrate and to seriously engage with transformation in our institutions. Static and shrinking budgets. Here again, you heard about it this morning. In terms of us as academic libraries within the institution, we are now being challenged to demonstrate our positionality. Where are we locating ourselves within the institution? As an asset, we are a huge asset to the institution how then are we demonstrating our return on investment? And I'm going to be speaking in this way because after experiencing these crises, there's a new language that is emerging for us as academic li library directors and librarians that we need to start becoming familiar with. Our value proposition that was raised as well. How are we demonstrating it? But what is the return on investment? For example, at UCT, my budget is 190 million. And I'm now sitting at the point where we are defining our budgets, crafting our budgets for next year. And I'm, going, I'm, and I'm being asked to account for every line item. Why do you want this? Can you not have that instead of this under these constrained circumstances? And, and I'm saying, but I need everything that I've submitted but I have to argue it. I have to be able to demonstrate why we need it for the, for the academy. And so within this particular context, in South Africa particularly, academic libraries have seen a tremendous growth since the 1990s. And I always see, see this also as a turning point for academic libraries. Like the emerging democracy, we emerged in our own. And that is when you started seeing how we functioned in a highly connected environment to such an extent now that it's par for course. We no longer talk about technology as a disruptor. It is part of who we are. The shift in the way we structure ourselves, the work behaviors, our work processes, it's all embedded. We, we touch it daily. We engage with it on a regular basis. However, change and innovation will always be required of us. And crises become the impetus for us to start looking at all of this. And so business interruption has become now the big thing for us here in terms of expecting the unexpected. We've become very complacent about who we are, how we're steaming ahead with all the new initiatives and the programs, etc., which is brilliant because it locates us at a very high standard of practice in the country. But when the unexpected hits us, we recognize what are the gaps within our institutions, within our own um, environments. The student protests, I think, was the biggest wake-up call, not only for, for um, universities, but also for us as libraries, COVID-19. But again, our agility, our resilience, our ability to, to, to how should I say, reinvent ourselves under these times worked to our advantage. We started having the changing world of work conversations in 2019. And before we knew it, from April 2020, the world of work changed. And so we cannot still talk about a changing world of work. We need to start accepting the fact that 
the world of work has changed and the way we work has changed. And so how do we rewire our thinking around that? And so I want to come back to the notion of a library by its very nature is a social and political agent. And, I, and I've got here three, three boxes, text boxes, the core values of librarianship. And maybe it's time for us to start thinking about it again. We tend to have moved away from some of these very significant values. The most important one is access. We always talk about access to content, access to knowledge resources, access to our physical spaces. But what are those barriers to access? We don't ever consider that, okay? Confidentiality and privacy. Yes, we're now talking because of the Poppy, uh, the Poppy Act, confidentiality, people's privacy, et cetera, is high on our conversation list, but we never considered it before. And so levels of access, who has access, et cetera. But I'm not going to go through that entire list because I will touch on it on the slide hereafter. The principles of social justice also speaks to access. It speaks to equity. Um, the core values of librarianship speaks to democracy. Here we speak to equity, human rights, the rights of an individual, and participation. And the last box I want to touch on is on the four cornerstones that seed democracy. And I hold this very dear. It was in 2004, when the former minister, the late Kader Asma, um, chaired the Conference on Human Rights and Democracy Education in the Curriculum, that was one of the very first education conferences in this country. And he emphasized the four cornerstones of democracy that every learner and student should be exposed to. And these are critical thinking. It was touched on this morning creative expression through art, a critical understanding of history, and multilingualism. It speaks directly to what we ought to be doing, but are we actually doing that, okay? And so what were these crises of note that impacted us? The first was the student protest, and I'm not gonna touch on the the, the smaller protests, student protests ha have become endemic and systemic in, our, in, our, in higher education in the country. But the student protests of 2015 to 2017 redefined higher education. It was premised on access, the critical understanding of history, where we found particular interpretations of history taking over the much more democratic principles of our history, democracy as well, and the right to education. In 2020, COVID-19 also, access to information became the primary requirement. So it, it threw up socioeconomic inequalities, right? The digital divide, it, it showed that up as well, irrespective of how well we equipped our students, et cetera, it, sh it depended on the institution and who were, who were directly impacted by this. And it did become a human rights issue as well. In 2021, we had the Jagger fire. Immediately thereafter, the issue of access was asked. Um, the fire happened on the 18th, on the 19th, we received an email, when can I pick up a, this particular scan from the Jagger Library? You, you wonder, you know, people don't read or don't hear about it, that the library was burned down, but I want my, my material. Preservation became a huge issue. Professionalism was very, very evident in how we managed it. And special collections as a public good. Why did it take a fire to raise the significance of special collections? What does special collections mean to each one of us? Have we actually explored why it is important? 
And so going forward, going forward, I'm going to just talk about within crises, what is it that we have been forced, I as an, a library director, been forced to consider, and my team as well, business continuity. When there is a crisis, the first thing you want to look at is business continuity. How do you ensure that your service continues? What is the approach we took? I personally look at it from a systems approach, that it is a whole system, and each person, each entity has a role. So the dynamic whole of the library, we've got to consider the resources, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But the important thing is digitalization, and I'll touch on it later. Why is that important? Because we function in an environment that is highly connected. Liz spoke about systems literacy. How many of us actually know and understand the systems we work with? We work with an integrated library management system. Oh, it's the job of the systems librarian or the um, electronic resources librarian. I don't need to know that. It is our responsibility to actually know and how it works. It's, I, I was very pleased to hear her talk about systems literacy, but also that is slightly different. But underpinning all of these crises and business continuity within the context of these crises, what are those guiding principles? We all need to understand what are those guiding principles. And then, of course, the expectations of executives and managers and the general staff. But underpinning it is an understanding of our role what is expected of us, and to have the big picture thinking. Okay, I'm fast running out of time. And then business interruption. The fire was a huge wake-up call. So I will allude to the fire, but I'm not going to show you any pictures, right? And so these are the accepted risks in any environment. And I think it, it, it behoves us to become familiar with this. What are the expected risks? Because whilst we may have these huge budgets, it does not mean I do not have a part to play in the insurance claim, or what is it that we insure our collections for? And so what are the appropriate actions that, and systems in place that we have should there be business interruption? COVID-19 was business interruption. So what were the systems in place? We didn't lose anything, but there were huge risks. Um, are we, uh, is our risk register? Do you have a risk register? Is it up to date, et cetera? What are your systems in place to mitigate risk? And so of course, we need to look at a sustainability strategy, not just a strategy for the next five years in terms of what we're going to be doing but what is our sustainability strategy? And these are all things that you can look at. You may be doing it, but we need to reflect on it as well. And so the turning point for us at this point in time is where we at a juncture, Lisa spoke about reflection. And I, and I think it is important for us to actually reflect at this time. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves. We need to acknowledge our strengths and what are those areas of development, those weaknesses, etc. How do we view ourselves? How do we describe ourselves? What is the language we're using to describe ourselves? What is the story we're going to tell? Are we passive? Are we dynamic? And so those are the kinds of things we need to start rewiring ourselves around. And so the other aspect that which is a turning point in all our organizations at the moment and institutions, is about leadership. Leadership is not just hierarchical, but it is now we need, we need decisive leadership, but leadership across the institution, diffuse leadership. And that is the strength of the organization. Affirmation of our role in the academy. The fire showed us that. COVID-19 has showed us that. And so we need to see how do we measure that affirmation. A survey was conducted at UCT among students in, um, in July last year. The library came up as their number one entity that they, 
they <coughs> preferred and used. The Jagger fire showed up also the full acknowledgement of um, librarians and their role in developing and managing these collections, how we were able to use our systems and re reconcile what was lost, etc. that professional skills that we hold and we have within our institutions need to be spoken about. We need to tell those stories. And so it does bring us to an existential question. Do we have clarity of purpose and of our role? And how do we then engage with that? I'm a very strong um, fan of Simon Sinek. I'm not a fan of management gurus, but he's one person that I really do uh, resonate with. And so digitalization, this was a quote from a leading data manager of a Malaysian uh, multinational, but I took the liberty of rewriting this, and that it's about using technology to improve how work gets done, transform how the library engages and interacts and creates new workflows and services for continued relevance, it is premised on streamlining organizational structures and redirecting staff, the human mind, the human creativity, to new ways of thinking, being, and doing. That's where we should be at the moment. I'm almost done, okay? And going forward, part of this reflective process, out of crises, et cetera, that we need to work on a people-centric and adaptive organization. Again, Simon Sinek says, a purpose is the heart and process is the backbone. The digitalization takes care of that. Then the people of your business are its soul. That's where we are at, at the moment. It's about people. How do we create that environment where our people flourish? Creating an empathetic environment, mental and health well-being is primary at the moment, and how do you bring out the best? Um, responsible and purposeful leadership, that's what is required. And I'm not going to go through all of that, but I just want to touch on the red points. The changed world of work and the way we work, accept it. It's not going to, by, not, by, by resisting it, it's not going away. Accept it. It has changed, right? We need to create a conducive and inclusive environment for people to develop their potential, new potentials, additional potential. Digital marketing to position ourselves, right? How do we leverage these moments of crises? They give us these opportunities. And so how do we leverage it? At UCT, uh, next, uh, our current, our new strategic plan, the, the, the motto, the vision is hashtag unleash. And so creating that environment for each one of you to unleash your potential. And from our side, academic innovation. We've looked at sustained innovation. We've looked at disruptive innovation. How do we take, how do we position ourselves within knowledge creation and the dissemination thereof? within the context of the future higher education and national and institutional conversations. That's the next step. How do we come together to have these very, very critical conversations? And I'm gonna ask you, as Einstein asked me, what was your great opportunity? This was what I've just shared with you. So I'm gonna ask you, what is your opportunity from all of these crises? Thank you very much. Jana, thank you very much, first of all, for coming through all the way. I think you've, you're better in person, really. <laughs> it was really lovely, and I think we've learned a lot, and I love this last quote, and I think we're going to leave it with this. In the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. I was thinking you're going to tell us about the fire and how you swept up everything. I thought I'm going to be disappointed, and after all, you've given us much more to think of. It's a rich talk and I think we're inspired by that, that we look at crisis in a new way to grow and to develop. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break. We need to be back, I think, in 10 minutes time. So please go and have some tea and coffee and then be back in 10 minutes time. Thank you very much. <laughs>